Good evening. My name is Kevin Fu, and today I'm going to talk about how some principles I use in bread making, which is my hobby, uh, reflects on how I conduct my research in my lab. In particular, I'm going to talk about some of my computer security research and why it requires a sort of why does it work attitude. Um, but the question I'll probably be getting and what I get from a lot of friends is, well, what on earth does bread making, you know, this kind of stuff have to do with computer security? Well, let's find out. Like most things in life, it begins with a sandwich. So one day I was in an elevator and I was talking with a colleague and I was very proud that I had made a sandwich because I would always go out to eat and order from one of the street vendors, but one day I decided I'd make my own sandwich. And my colleague looked at me in the elevator and he kind of snarled and he said, oh yeah, did you make the bread? And so at that point, I kind of, my face turned red, and I said, well, no, I didn't make the bread. Of course I didn't make the bread. And it was really at that point that I decided, you know what, I'm taking these simple things for granted, and I'm not asking enough why questions. I really need to find out how to make this bread, and I want to know why it works. So what I'm going to talk about today is sort of scientific discovery by the same kinds of reasons why I took a look at how does bread work. So, what is the difference between good bread and just your average old bread? Um, because bread is really just composed of a few major components. You've got your flour, you've got your water, uh, you've got your yeast, uh, and you have a little bit of salt. So how and, how and why does this work? If everybody's using the same ingredients, how does one loaf differ from another? Well, it's technique. And uh, I have to say my technique today I could probably improve upon, but uh, this is called hotel bread uh, because I made it in my hotel room. Um, but uh, <laughs> here you can see it's sort of rising, and unfortunately uh, uh, the thing with bread is, uh, what, what I like to say is that uh, cooking is an art and baking is a science, and if you disturb the science of the bread, you'll end up with a flat loaf, and this is flat. Um, but uh, perhaps I can show you what would happen, how we might reconcile this bread. Uh, in the bakeries, we would call this rustic bread, and we'd sell it for twice the price. <laughs> Anyhow, what am I doing wrong, though? Um, I have all these ingredients. I have flour, I have water, I have yeast, I, I have some salt. But uh, am I cheating here? I've got this yeast that you can find in your supermarket. Why am I cheating? Well, did I make the yeast? red-faced once again. So where does yeast come from? Well, that's what I tried to figure out, and I was a graduate student at the time, so of course I had a lot of free time on my hands, and if you're not yet in college, well, you have tons of free time. <laughs> so I decided uh, I'd seed my own bread starter, and you know, I'm not gonna go to the store and buy my own yeast, I'm gonna make it myself. So I read a book that said, well, you can harvest yeast and bacteria from the very air, and you can also harvest it from the skin of, a, say, an apple. So I said, okay, I'll throw an apple in this jar and I'll put some flour and water and see what happens. So uh, I took one of my uh, weather, uh, weather thermometers and it's in Fahrenheit here. You can see it's about uh, 80 degrees Fahrenheit or 26 degrees centigrade. The ideal temperature for uh, a good loaf, by the way, is 25 degrees centigrade for perfect fermentation. So I was pretty close for my first try. So how long does it take for this to happen? Um, well, if you don't buy your commercial yeast and you really want to know how things, where they come from, you got to wait. It takes a little bit long. So how long does it take to cultivate yeast and bacteria that brings the, that flavor, that crumb, that crisp outside of, of a typical sort of European style loaf? We could sit here, I'm about to show you this picture, um, and it lasts from, it looks like 8 a.m. that day until about 2 p.m. So we're going to be here just a few hours, so don't worry, just keep watching. Um, let's see, here we go. Yeah, so it, it's taking a little while, so that was, what, six hours or so, and uh, as you can see, it didn't rise a whole lot, and that's because there's no commercial yeast in there whatsoever. So if you do this long enough times, it takes hours and actually days to finally get a strong enough yeast to, to rise, uh, to, to, make, to make a bread rise, uh, you, can, you can actually make a, loaf, a good loaf of bread. Problem is, am I still cheating? Have I not figured out and answered all the why questions of the layers of how this works? What have I not made from scratch? The wheat, correct, sir. So my next step was, well, I'm going to mill my own flour because I need to appreciate where and why it exists. Um, 
So here I have a picture of my mill and some uh, kernels, and it was really hard to find wheat berries, I have to say. You can't just get them in your average supermarket in the US. And I went a little bit beyond that. I decided, you know what, wheat berries, buying that in the store, that's cheating. So I decided to plant a wheat field in my backyard. <laughs> my wife thought I was a little crazy. Um, my neighbors were actually, they came up to me a, uh, a while ago and they said, what's that big brown patch in your backyard? Uh, unfortunately, the, the weed experiment failed, and the lesson learned is you should just buy it in the supermarket. <laughs> I, I ended up just feeding the local rabbit population. They, they ate all my wheat. Nevertheless, it was, it was a good scientific process. And if you put all this together and you learn the technique, uh, you don't have to go to school. You could read books or just keep trying and learn from your failure. Always fail. If you're not failing, you're not trying hard enough. You'll end up with a good loaf of bread. So that's going to kind of set the mantra for, for this talk, and that is always ask why questions. Don't take anything even simple for granted because maybe it doesn't actually work. And where we're going to try to, I'm going to try to draw some parallels is with my research in computer security. And what I like to talk when I teach my undergraduates about computer security, I say, well, what's so special about security? Um, you know, when I learned to make bread, mostly it was about re-implementing everything from scratch and learning from my failures. So, Similarly, in my security research, I try to discover how the system works or why it doesn't. Why does it break? Why could a hacker get into it? So, during my sister's wedding, we were at a hotel, and I noticed this keypad, and it was on the hotel door. So, defining what it means to be a correct keypad, I quiz my students, and I say, what does it mean to be correct? And usually somebody speaks up, and they say, well, if you type in the correct number, the door opens. And I say, yep, you're smart. But then I say, uh, well, security, though, what does it mean to be a secure door? And some, you, there's a lot of, like, uh, you know, head scratching. They can't, they, it's really hard to define what is security because it's a negative. So uh, I'll just give you a counterexample. So here's an example of why security is hard. So in this case, at the hotel, the hotel staff was kind enough to put the uh, pin code right on the door. <laughs> they built a placard. And uh, this was in a Spanish-speaking country, so if you didn't speak English, the numbers were also in Spanish at the bottom. <laughs> so building a security system is actually quite difficult. It's really hard to get right, and it's often because people aren't asking the right why questions. So what I'm going to do in the rest of my remaining time is give you some examples of security and privacy research from my lab. And the, the theme is I'm always asking why does it work, why does it work, and well, why does it always not work, sometimes not work? So the first case I'm going to talk about is an RFID credit card. Many of you probably use the Octopus card, and it's based on a similar technology. It's contactless, and you just wave it, uh, and somehow, magically, the turnstile knows who you are. Well, in the United States, we have something similar to that called contactless credit cards. And in my work, we discovered, uh-oh, the card reveals your credit card number, your expiration date, and the cardholder name, what we say, in the clear, to anybody who can just get near you to get close enough. So I had one of my students build a device that could copy these cards and just replay them. And because we wanted to see, well, could we make it from scratch? You know, the good old bread-making analogy. So he made one from scratch, and he was able to make it say, hello, I'm Kevin's card, I'm Kevin's card. And we were able to fool the various readers into believing that was a credit card, even though it was just this pile of computer chips. So I have a short video here. Hopefully the audio is working. Uh, to explain a little bit about that problem. by companies as the next generation of credit cards. The data.